President Dick Newton. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Great to have everyone back. I see that uh, just like church, folks come on down to the front. We got plenty of room. Can all squeeze in. It's a great to see a sea of blue out there and another great Air Force day. Ladies and gentlemen, it truly gives me a distinct honor and a privilege to introduce our next speaker, Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force, James Cody, our 17th Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force, actually enlisted in the United States Air Force, I believe, back in November 1984. If you add about 28 years and a couple months, he woke up in January in 2013 as our 17th Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force, but he didn't get there all by himself. He had another Chief Master Sergeant with him, his wife, Athena, who's with us also. Athena, great to have you here. And although we love your husband, we're very thankful and grateful for your service also and continue to serve in the capacity of going out and making sure that we're still continue to connect and take care of our airmen and their families. Thank you, Athena, for your work. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me welcome to the stage now our 17th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant James Cody. Chief, stage is yours. Thank you, General. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, hey, first, happy birthday, Air Force. 66 years. Pretty good, huh? All right. General Rice, General Wolfenberg, and General Shad, thanks so much for coming, and certainly Athena, uh, General Jackson, I'm sorry. Uh, and Athena, thanks for coming. General Newton, appreciate the uh, introduction. And certainly, you know, yet again, uh, as this week is kind of winding down, and we'll culminate the, tonight with our ball, uh, again, a thanks to AFA and all they're doing for our Air Force and hosting this event. General McNabb, sir, I'm sorry I didn't catch you there. Great to see you, sir. Um, so a lot going on in our Air Force. I'll give you a little bit, you know, uh, it was probably about six and a half months ago I had the first opportunity to address uh, AFA down in Orlando and I talked about some of the things I'll focus on. So I thought I would take this opportunity to kind of just give you an update of what we have been able to see over the last seven months. We've accomplished some really good stuff over the last seven months. We have a lot of things to do ahead of us, but uh, we're actually in pretty good shape on a lot of the things that we were talking about and making some really good strides. So, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of, if I can get my slides to start building up here, that would be great. You know, a consistent theme here from the secretary and certainly the chief, and I would not be a good wingman if I weren't right there. But anybody that's heard me speak before understand that this is what I like to talk about, and that is about our airmen and they are our greatest asset. You know, we're here with industry and there's a tremendous amount of technology down there and a lot of great work being done to bring capabilities to our nation and our Air Force. But without those airmen, it just is stuff. It just really is stuff. And how does it all kind of start? And you know, General Rice, Rice will love this piece because uh, you know, I have a, certainly a fond affiliation, but this is gonna be a little bit of old home week for all of our enlisted folks in here as we build this next slide. You know, I can feel the chills right now that we all get as you look at those pictures because it doesn't matter how long you wear this uniform, it takes about a half a second to get back where it all began when you see those photos and you recognize what it really is all about and where it started for all of us in the room that are enlisted. And, uh, you know, it's kind of magic. I used to always talk that way. You know, it's amazing what we do in eight and a half weeks. So you, you know, you get to talk to thousands of parents from across the the world and literally you have to kind of recognize that we bring in airmen from across the United States from across the globe many of them not even US citizens they come in and become citizens once they join our Air Force and they all have these great stories you know we're bringing in just be around you know 330 some odd thousand airmen a year give or take as we make the final adjustments throughout the year that's every week except for two weeks a year Seven to 800 young men and women become airmen in our Air Force. That happens every year after year after year after year. Over seven million men and women have crossed into the blue at Lackland Air Force Base. That's a pretty significant thing to think about, and that is why airmen equal air power. If you don't get it right there, it doesn't get right anywhere down the line, and I do believe we're getting it right. You know, and uh, when you have that air power, you get great airmen. If I get the next slide, and this is how we're winning the fight. I tell you a few stories about some great airmen here that are out there getting it done. 
And uh, it's important that you think about and tell these stories about our airmen because it gives us that connection with each other, I think, that is really important and understands that while you can see technology all around each of these airmen, it's that airman that's making it happen. You know, up there in the top hand left, you see Sierra Dofo, Seymour and Sierra Dofo. She's a great young boom operator. She's flying on a KC-135 there, which is about two and a half the times of her age. And she's refueling a B-52, which is also about two and a half times her age. You know, uh, she is second generation Air Force. Her dad in the reserves there at McConnell came in and enlisted in our Air Force in 1975. She grew up loving and wanting to fly, so she's doing it right now. She actually does want to fly someday for our Air Forces and working on that. But her dad said, hey, you need to go in the Air Force. You need to go in as an enlisted person. And here's an opportunity for you to get there, see what flying in the Air Force is all about, see what service is all about. And she's doing a great job for us every single day. You see uh, Staff Sergeant Vincent St. Uh, owns there. Uh, I met him a couple weeks ago, Athena and I, and Chief O'Dowling, uh, we met him up in um, Syracuse, New York. He's working at the Eastern Air Defense Sector. And uh, he and I got along right away because he, he speaks like I do. You see, he, he speaks just like I do. He speaks from the Northeast, it was pretty good. But let me tell you, when you sit there and you know, you ever watch some of these movies that they have out there and you'll see the, these snippets of Air Force people in action? And sometimes you'll see these real junior people in there and people will make a comment, oh, that's not how it works. You know, you wouldn't see people of that junior rank making those type of decisions like in those movies. And the honest God truth, you absolutely would. And they were actually in these facilities, that's why they used those junior uh, you know, NCOs and senior NCOs because they went and did their research. I mean, he's, an air defense coordinator. I mean, this guy up there is keeping America safe every single day. I mean, we are watching. This is the busiest airspace east of the Mississippi. That's what they're doing up there. Every single flight that is operating in the air, and whether it's tra you know, whether it's actually being um, in the system or out of the system, they're tracking that, as well as the coastline. And every boat that moves, we know which ones we know about, and we know which ones we don't know about and we need to find out about. And we're connected throughout every department of the service right there in that facility. It's pretty amazing what our airmen do every day to keep us safe. It really is. That's uh, down the bottom uh, left there, that staff sergeant Justin Lasseter. We met him when we were at Kadena. So you see the boss and I sitting there, and this guy is all charged about what he does for our Air Force. He's sitting there, uh, he's, he's a maintainer on helicopter engines. And he's sitting in there showing us how on the compression rotor blades there of that engine, how they're doing this blending of the blade so we can save money. I mean, versus replacing all that, they get in there with a file and they have this tolerance and he sits there and he files that thing down, whether it was damaged just because of utilization, you know, normal utilization or some type of foreign object damage. He gets in there and literally we're saving hundreds of thousand dollars on each engine as well as the time associated with it would take us to get a replacement engine into theater and into those weapon systems. Pretty amazing. And then this bottom right, Senior Airman Andrew Candelaria, he's a great airman. He's over in Afghanistan right now, and he's helping us get this retrograde done, and we're really knee-deep into that. You know, when you talk about the stuff that we've got to get out of that theater in the period of time we have left, the math really doesn't add up. It just doesn't. We have a lot of work to do in a very short period of time, and we'll probably step up to it in a different way and figure out some new ways so you look at that, you know, that's cargo. We're moving about 1,000, uh, you know, rolling stock uh, every month and about 200 uh, containers by air alone. That's not all the stuff that's still moving out via ground, just by air. So you look at him, you say, oh, that must be one of our air reporters, one of our 2T2 type of guys doing that, right? He's on the back of a C-17. And nope, that's a maintainer pitching in to get it done every day because there's that much work to be done over there. And that's the team effort that we're getting done. You know, so those are just a few examples of what our airmen bring to the fight. Let me tell you about another guy that's helping us win the fight right here. Tech Sergeant Chris Curtis. You know, three years ago when 17 broken bones, you wouldn't have thought that guy back in April would be sitting on the back of a CV-22 Osprey getting ready to go back in the air. But let's play his video. Air Force CV-22 Osprey crashed late Thursday night in southeastern Afghanistan. NATO officials say the Osprey was carrying U.S. forces when it went down about seven miles west of Kalat City in Zabul province. The question of me flying again was the big elephant in the room. You know, can you do this? And we went down the list of things I can and cannot do. And I said, okay, simulated crash. Uh, 
when I crashed, I was on NVGs on my crew position on the tail of the aircraft uh, with a gun, with a 50 cal looking out, out back. And then I noticed the ground immediately coming up to meet me. Once we hit the ground, I went into the ceiling. I was strapped to a gunner's belt, which had a little slack compared to everybody else. I actually didn't know I was upside down until I actually had my right hand and I was, I was feeling some reference points. And I remember kind of feeling roughly like my bones were broken, some of them. Uh, once I did wake up at Walter Reed, um, I honestly thought it was the next day. <laughs> um, Next thing you know, they're telling me, hey, it's not. It's, it's about a week later. You think about crashes, you know, guys you're, or on the battlefield or get hurt, and you don't think about that. You don't think about right now, today, is someone's day zero. A gentleman came up in his wheelchair one day, and he was uh, an Olympian, a Paralympian. And he told me, he's like, you know, just thinking, just being mentally down will we'll take you down physically. And I was like, yeah, right, come on. You know, I can't be, I'm just gonna, why me through this? He said, no, he said, I lost both my legs and I felt bad for myself. And I started going on, and I just started generating other physical problems because of that. I said, really? I said, you sure? He said, yeah. He said, so stay positive. I think of it as positive uh, stubbornness, I really do. You can't just say, I'm gonna go fly when you're in a hospital bed. You're gonna say, okay, that's the end goal, What's tomorrow? What's today? Looking back, I got to see a bigger picture of how our service operates on many different levels that most people will never see. I really walked away and I remember talking to my dad like, I, I got nothing. You guys were there. You did everything that I could ask for for my family and me. And, uh, and of course, they, you know, once they learned that I wanted to continue flying again, no one questioned it. Of course, I'm sure they were thinking of, you know, I, I'm human, I'd probably be like, are you sure this guy? I mean, come on. And, but you know what, in the end they said, okay, look, they're looking at everything and making sure, yeah, this guy, he could do it. Let's just say it's on him now. So they waited for me and they continue to support me during that time. And here I am. You know, this is the great kind of airman we have and why we're winning the fight. You know, what Chris doesn't talk about in the video, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to chat with him a few times and see how he's doing and where he's at. You know, what he doesn't talk about is there he is all busted up in that aircraft, all strapped in. He doesn't tell you about what took place just before they hit the ground. So he's sitting there in the back of that aircraft and all of a sudden he realizes that ground's coming up pretty quick, really quick. So he makes this split second decision just before impact. He dives into the fuselage of the aircraft and he's, he's bit literally airborne uh, when they crash. Uh, so he's getting, you know, he suffers the injuries that he talks about during the thing. So, you know, in the moments immediately after the crash, he starts to get some level of consciousness. And I say some level because he even will describe it as a daze of in and out. He looks out, he sees pieces of the fuselage, he sees the aircraft opened up. And he has two thoughts. And he says, this, you know, in his mind, it seems like a lifetime, but this is moments. This is literally microseconds of time as this is going through his mind. But he says it seemed like this lifetime. And he was, had this, this subconscious thought, do I lay here and just lay here and wait? Or do I do what I was trained to do? And he did what he was trained to do. Because what he doesn't talk about is the 16 Army Rangers that were in that aircraft with him. They were strapped in. They were waiting for somebody to tell them how to egress out of that aircraft and how to get safe. So he started yelling, gunner, gunner, because he knew that they would understand what that meant. If he said flight engineer, they'd been like, what does that mean? He started yelling to them, so they started making their way to where he was so they could egress out of the back of the aircraft. And he's all strapped in him. He's unable to get himself out. So they make their way back to him, they grab him, they get out of the aircraft, and they make it back. And then what a tremendous story. You know, he's back in action. He did that flight back in April. Now he's up in Amarillo with us working as we, he's helping us take the delivery of our last um, order of the CD-22s. He's about there with five military members. So he knows this aircraft. He knows what we need it to be able to do and what it needs to, how it needs to perform when we take it. And he's out there making that happen every day. And that's why we're going to win the fight. And we're just like that every single day. <laughs> we have some other great airmen that have helped us win the fight. And they're still fighting. And some of you know some of these great airmen. Um, you know, a lot of you know Des, Mass Sergeant Joe Desiloria. You know, 
great story about Des, you know, back in 2011, literally three months after he married his lovely wife, Lisa, he goes off downrange yet again as one of our EOD guys, uh, you know, ready to hit it. He's out on what they would be considering a mission that they've done hundreds of times before. In an area they've walked back and forth and they feel it's cleared their safety. He's on the way back to his vehicle and he steps on an IED and forever his life has changed. He lost both his legs, his left arm. He suffers from PTSD, traumatic brain injury. But what an inspiration this airman is because just two weeks ago, he started working back at AFSOC headquarters again. He's back down at Herbert Field. He's with his teammates. He's shaping the future in our Air Force. He's helping us win the fight. An amazing, an amazing man, truly. Right next to him, Staff Sergeant Brian Williams. I'll talk about him in a minute. These are some of the folks that have, uh, that have just recently come back. You have Senior Airman Taylor Savage. You know, I met her, that's four days after she was in an IED explosion. She was out there in a movement. She's a med tech. She's on her way back. They're, they're in a movement. They hit an IED. She breaks both her ankles, fractured pelvis, fractured spine, shrapnel to the face, ruptured eardrum. This is her four days later here. And what was amazing is Athena and I went up to visit her. We wanted to see how she was doing. She made a stand outside for 15 minutes so she could make herself up. She wanted to look good. I mean, she, th this is our airman. I mean, this is how they are. This is just right after this thing happens. I mean, she's, they just couldn't believe how fast she was coming around after those type of injuries. She was there. We got to meet her mom and her, her brother is a senior airman on our Air Force. She's just a little bit ahead of them. They're a little bit competitive, just a little bit. But her, her brother was there. He's an intel guy from Whiteman, and uh, she's back up here with us, still recovering at uh, Bethesda and doing great stuff. Yep, up there at the top, that's senior airman Devin Butcher. Just a, a point on um, Taylor. That was her first deployment, out on her first deployment, and this is what happens. I mean, this stuff is real, and it's still going on. It really is. So Devin Butcher, one of our special tactics airmen, he's out there on his first deployment. They're out there doing a sweep. They get some insurgents out there. They're trying to flesh out, gather some intel on it. All of a sudden, they're getting hit with RPGs, and he takes shrapnel. This guy is sitting on a plane. You see him trying to get up. I mean, literally, he didn't want to come home. He wanted to stay there, you know, heal me up, get me back in a fight with my teammates. I mean, I've got work to do here. This guy's not even fully qualified yet. We put him out in the field. He's getting the training he needs. He's qualified to be where we have him, but he's not the round that he will be in the years to come. But he just wants to be in the fight. He really does. So then you see, I talked about uh, Brian Williams uh, down there, and you see him right there with his working dog, Carly. So one of our defenders, and about a year and a half ago, he was hit by an IED when he was out on a mission out there. And Brian's with us today. Brian, could I ask you to stand up just for a minute? Brian's kind of a shy guy. He, he's really not, but. And, and, I, and I asked Brian to stop over because, uh, you know, Athena and I had the opportunity to meet him shortly after coming into the position and really got to know his story. Thanks, Brian. I'll, I'll ask you to come up maybe later again. But. Uh, you know, he's made a remarkable recovery. He really has. In just a short time that I've known him and Athena have known him, um, he's really come a long, long way in his recovery. And we're getting ready to send him back down to Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst next month. And he's going to go back into his unit and work with the, the dog handlers. So Carly did. There's a great story about Carly. You know, our former Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary Donnelly. So Carly actually didn't sustain really uh, injuries in the accident that would prevent him from continuing to serve. However, you know, obviously Brian and Carly have a very close relationship uh, and have for a long time. So one of the last things, literally the last thing that Secretary Donnelly did prior to um, leaving the position is he went over and he met with Brian and he brought Carly and retired Carly and gave him to Brian. So pretty amazing story. So Carly's actually down there in New Jersey right now with uh, Brian's fiance, Emily. She's a defender down there also, getting ready to receive him back and uh, get him back to work, but, uh, but a really a remarkable story. But it's important to note that this stuff didn't happen that long ago and it's still happening today. You know, we have a lot going on on our Air Force, but we have airmen in the fight. We're winning the fight, but it comes at a cost. It truly comes at a cost. And how we take care of each other and how we strengthen the team, next slide, is really important how we know about our people, how we know these stories and the sacrifices 
that they're making is really important. It comes down to this face-to-face -face communication that we absolutely have to have. You know, it's amazing to me that I had to come into this position to probably know some of those stories that I know. I should know them better. I'm a senior enlisted leader in our Air Force. I should know the sacrifice our airmen are making in service of their country. We need to spend more time with each other. We need to know about each other's lives, the things that are important to us, the things that are affecting us. As we move into the future, the level of our, our resiliency will only increase and the strength that we have as we come together and know each other, respect each other, trust each other, understand what each of us are doing. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to get information out there. You, you heard the chief talk about it. So, you know, I have Facebook now and Twitter. I don't consider that my mechanism of, of communicating with you. I do use that and will use that as a chief will as a method to inform you about what's going on in our Air Force maybe share a story with you, but it's not the connection that I'm looking to have with you. This is the connection that I'm looking to have with you, the time we spend together. So you have a, uh, a great airman out here uh, talking with airman. Can we play the video? Mission, it's what we do. Every day we provide the global vigilance, global reach and global power we need to win the fight strengthen the team, and shape the future. We move fast, we move hard, and we get things done. But we need to focus on one very important thing, communicating face to face. Face to face communication is how we connect with each other and our Air Force. It is how we solidify the value we place in each other. We must take a step back. We must look each other in the eye and we must communicate. So we're bringing it back. Roll call. Every month at least, roll call messages will go out to our team highlighting how we as airmen are getting things done, how we are winning the fight, strengthening the team, and shaping the future. The intent is simple. Every day or every week, gather with your team and communicate. Create the venue to connect with airmen as airmen. If we communicate, we stay informed. If we stay informed, we connect. If we connect, we value. And if we value, we win. We are the world's greatest Air Force, powered by airmen. Fueled by innovation. Let's communicate together. As a team, with our team. Roll call. So that goes out today to our airmen. And again, this is really somewhat back to basics. We've done this. We have, you know, this isn't really a new idea. This is just an emphasis on the fact of we have got to get in front of each other and communicate. We have great examples of this taking place in our Air Force, have, always will. This is really about putting it across our entire force. We have to do this. I could give you great, great examples. Happens today when we do guard mount with our defenders. Happens in many of our units where they bring people together every day to look each other in the eye, to talk about how we're winning the fight, strengthening the team, and shaping the future. So we're gonna do this, we're gonna monitor it. I think it's the right thing to do. I think our Air Force believes it's the right thing to do. So we'll get there, and this is how we'll continue to care for our airmen, because we'll know our airmen, because we spend time with our airmen. Next slide. Here's the deal, though. This is the reality. I talked about this at the aggregate when I first came into the position, and you know, as you are in this position, any period of time, you start to get a real appreciation for all that stuff that we're doing, all that really cool looking stuff that we're doing, there's a price tag associated with that. And it's a significant price tag. We are a stressed force. Whether we want to accept that and acknowledge that or not, it's a fact. Because these things are taking place in our Air Force. 777 cases this year of sexual assault. Not that they took place this year, they did not. This is spanning back over 10 years. Our focus on getting this problem corrected and moving forward is significant, but nonetheless, that is amongst us. 63 cases of confirmed suicides this year to date. There are many out there pending final resolution. 224 cases of child abuse and 308 cases of domestic violence. We clearly are not connected with these airmen in a way that we need to be to help them through the challenges of life that can sometimes lead to these type of things. We will do better, and we're working on it. Next slide, we've got great airmen that are doing just what we need them to do 
to overcome some of these challenges that we face as a force doing what we do for our nation. Top left there is a group of women from Spangdalem. They call themselves Spangdamen. And basically what they do, this is, again, this is, things don't need to be cosmic. And it's not about money. If you look at everything in this slide, this is about people giving up their time to connect. So they get together as women in the military, and they share common experiences, challenges, goals, you know, frustrations, all the things that go on in our lives. But there's a common bond amongst them. They're women airmen. And it's different. That bottom left-hand group is a group of men from Spangdalem, and they call that the round table. And they get together, and they talk about their challenges and the things that are going on in their lives and how they're working through that. And they're gaining strength and support through each other. They utilize those venues as a release to some of their frustrations. But they get stronger when they do that. That top uh, right slide is a great kind of example of some things that we're doing for airmen. This took place down at Joint Base Langley Fort Eustis. They had a 90-day event that they call We Are Family. And over 90 days, they did, they did all these different types of events to connect airmen in the work center, outside of the work center. They had retreats. They brought in different people to speak. They just had roundtable discussions in their offices about things that necessarily weren't all the day-to-day -day business that we're doing in support of our mission. They connected with each other. They began to appreciate each other in much different ways than they ever knew before. And some of them had worked together for years. In a mere period of that time, they got to know each other in a more meaningful way. They have a stronger relationship today. They trust each other more today than they did prior to this event. And then this bottom right-hand slide, uh, I'm going to play a video, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> Today there are 690,000 airmen and their families serving in our United States Air Force. 690,000 airmen with 690,000 lives and 690,000 stories. What if we could glimpse into those lives? What if we could hear those stories? Now we can. This is Storytellers. The anger came right away. It's the very first thing that came with the anger, like um, upset. And then right after that is more of, wait a minute, hold up. I've been in this situation before. But now I'm the supervisor. What do I need to do? How do I prepare them? How do I tell them that it's gonna be okay? And how do I get them to talk? I don't think I've ever felt more helpless, um, useless uh, in, in my life. It was just a feeling of I can't do anything and I feel like I need to do, be there to do everything for my wife and it was just the worst feeling that I've ever felt in my entire life. Once Tom got killed and then Adam got killed, it kind of made me realize how shallow my motivations were and uh, kind of made me understand that, you know, that the job that we have is actually a job of life and death. It's almost like a motivation where you know, these guys that I knew doing the job that we all love because it's almost like you want to, to live your life and do the job to the best of it, like exploit it all you can. Uh, almost in honor of those guys because they can't do that anymore. It's, it just hit me like the next morning I was like, I'm 26 year old and I'm so unhappy and it's because it's, you know, all this stuff that's weighing me down. Like seriously, that morning like I woke up, I thought of that and I was like, that's it, you know, like that day I joined the Y and I just, I just showed up. Roger. 
this time where things I could get rid of by drinking, I couldn't. I was starting to see things during the day. Uh, I felt like I was just losing my mind, believe it or not. At that point, I was uh, covering things up pretty good still. And uh, two senior NCOs came over to me and uh, gave me a hard talk. We were in UFG camp. Now you have like um, some people learned it still coming in between the body with, with no hands. You know, some of them have like one leg, or some of them don't have either one of them. And seeing little babies just running around like don't even know, have no, little infant, like 24, 36 months old infant, wandering around, don't even know what's going on. We've all heard uh, our chief of staff talk about how every airman has a story and this effort that really began at Insulik with a group of folks that came together and you heard their stories, they're just snippets about them and they kind of just give you the kind of caption of a little bit but the, if you really knew their stories you know, seeing Airman Ba there, he's from Sierra Leone and he came home from school when he was 14 years old to find both his parents killed, ended up being in, placed in a refugee camp worked his way to the United States. The military helped that action happen for him. He ends up deciding he wants to join our military, our Air Force, to give back. I mean, that's the kind of caliber of people that come in and serve. Each one of those airmen had a story. Some of them related to their work as an airman. Some of them related to their lives at home and the facts and how that impacts them as people. Sharing those st stories not only gave them strength and resiliency, it gave the people that heard those stories strength and resiliency, because we're not in this alone. It is really important that we kind of emphasize this as we continue to try to care for our airmen. Next slide. And tethered to caring for our airmen is caring for our families, because we are connected. We always will be connected. and. Uh, Again, I have the very broadest of definitions of family. It can be a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a wingman, a neighbor. It's where you gather your strength. It's all family. We are all family in this room. I truly believe that. But bringing our families into where we work is meaningful. It keeps them connected with us, that that's not where daddy goes, that's not where mom goes, you know. It's what we do together because our families sacrifice and serve along with us. A great little picture of a young man there visiting the EOD folks at Insulik when they brought them out. They're out there on the flight line getting to see the equipment. It, it, it's a normalization of their lives and lives that truly aren't normal compared to everybody else's. But it brings strength. And then I got to talk about, you know, our spouses and how amazing they are. And General Newton, uh, you know, certainly mentioned Athena, but I have to kind of call out Miss Betty and Athena. And I know all the senior spouses that are out there that I am exposed to and how much they do to try to bring our Air Force families together and gain strength from that solidarity and what it is that we do. And we cannot thank them enough. And we cannot work hard enough to resource them and keep them connected and informed enough because their strength is our strength. It, it truly, truly is. Next slide. When you're caring for airmen and families, you have to immediately have this discussion about work-life balance. Otherwise, it's just a hollow discussion. It's all of it. You heard General Welsh talk about this a little bit yesterday. I continuously talk about this when we get out. We're broke here. We're really broke here in some areas, and we really need to fix ourselves. It is not about doing more with less. Our end effect may be we do more with less, but it's not about the individual airmen doing more with less. We might be able to accomplish more with less people, but it's not going to be because we put it on our airmen's back. It's just going to be because we do things smarter or we have different technology to exploit. But this concept of doing more on our enemies, fact, we have already exceeded you know, our credits in this area as an Air Force. I'll go back to that slide where it says we must do better. Because we must do better. 
you know, these are just a couple of things that we're kind of working on. We're trying to open up the aperture. They're not all inclusive. There's a lot of things going on in our Air Force, you know, but we're going to get our gyms accessible 24 hours a day anywhere we can in the Air Force. That helps with the resiliency of our Airmen. It helps them find some work-life balance where they don't feel they're jammed into a period of time where, because this is about resiliency as much as it's about anything else. And you've got to have that piece connected here. You know, you talk about some single airman programs, you know, forever, uh, I can look back nearly three decades and, you know, as you became more senior, they started, you started to kind of be put in these positions where you were charged with doing things for our young airmen. So you go to our young airmen and say, what do you want? And arguably, nine out of 10 times, the first thing they say is nothing. They're good. I mean, to be honest, most of our airmen right up front say, hey, they're pretty good. And then, of course, we'll ask them 15 times and they'll make something up because they just want to be stopped asking. You know, they, okay, I'll give you something. But what we really kind of try to do is now try to just give them resources and say, what would you do with the resource and step back? Instead of us trying to drive it, let them drive it. So they're out there, you know, they're out here to, at a range, shooting, you know, whatever they find for their location, what brings them some balance? It doesn't have to be that they go home with their family. It may be that they just to go someplace and decompress, get some balance in their life. They have some downtime. You know, I love this picture of the chief and his son down there. And why I say that and why we wanted to put a senior leader in there is because it starts with senior leadership. And of course, this is the enlisted perspective. That's why I put an enlisted person there. But uh, if we don't get it right, if we don't go home, if we don't go spend time with our families, if we don't cut out, what makes us think any of our airmen are going to do it? You know, at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. There will be work to do tomorrow. I promise you, there will be work to do tomorrow, and a lot of it. You come to work. You do what our Air Force needs to do. You work hard. This isn't about going downrange. This isn't about when the flag goes up and us all going full bore. We know about that. We commit to that every single day. This is about when we're back here. It has to be reasonable. It has to be sustainable. We've got to get right with this. I think we're working on that direction. I really do. But until we have this work-life balance right, we're not going to fix a lot of the things we have. We're not going to truly be caring for our eminent families. We're not going to work on some of those things that we really need to root out of our, our midst. We're just not because we're going to stress and push people beyond what is reasonable over time. And when things look different in the future, and they will look different in the future, the very best of our airmen will make different decisions. And it won't be to stay on this team, because it's been unreasonable to do so. So we're getting right with that. I do believe we're getting right with that. We're having this discussion. Lots of great efforts. Next slide. Let's talk about these folks. You know what? We had them up on stage last night. Pretty impressive picture, right? They make us all so proud. So we talked about the 12 of them, right? But there's 10 people up there that actually put them there. So we had a little bit of play in it, but I'm telling you, they had major play in it. We're talking about dads up there. We're talking about wives. We had a husband there representing his wife because she's deployed. That's what generates us. That's the power of families. And that creates air power. Next slide. So we got to shape the future here. Uh, I'm going to ask real quick before I talk about this next slide for our EBOD and our advisors to stand up for just one second. I know the chief did yesterday. But uh, these senior enlisted leaders out here, and there's a lot more of them, they're not all here today. But they've been here all week, uh, thanks, chiefs. Uh, they're shaping your future. I mean, I am really narrowed in and focused in on the deliberate development of our force and how we're going to make significant strides forward. Uh, we're going to not belabor so many things for so long anymore. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people with a lot of good ideas. And there's a lot of people out there that we're learning from on how to move forward, and we're going to move forward. And they're doing that. They've been here all week working feverishly over transforming the enlisted evaluation systems and making sure we fully appreciate and um, account for the impacts on promotion and assignments and whatnot, because it's a big thing to do that. But they're working it. And this is significant. Uh, as well as many other issues. Let me talk a little bit about, you know, when you think about deliberate development too, let me kind of add on this. It's deliberate development in the, in the three areas that we have to look at as an Air Force. That's training, education, and experience. We have to be deliberate in these areas. We have to be discerning in these areas. When you talk about the force of the future, you all heard about, you know, speculation and reality that we're going to be a smaller force. These investments become more important over time. We're not this big force with lots of people that might be able to do stuff. We have to know exactly what every airman is capable of doing if we're going to be able to get to the effects that our nation is going to ask us to do. So we need to be deliberate about it. And on the enlisted side of the house, that's not always been the case. We've kind of taken a broader approach as, hey, we'll kind of develop everybody, and some people will kind of cull out. 
We're going to be very deliberate about this. We're transforming PME. We are in the midst of that. We are right here just about a month away from instituting the first transition phase of this with the Senior NCO Academy. What excites me the most about this for the first time in the development of enlisted PME, we have developed something that is good for all components of our Air Force, the active, the guard, and the reserve. Previous models were not very conducive for everybody receiving the same type of education in the same manner. This blended approach will provide for that. It will ensure that our airmen have the right skills, the right education at the right time in their careers so we can leverage that into the future as the United States Air Force. So I'm really excited about this. This is different. This is a big paradigm shift and very difficult for the senior folks in the room to get their head wrapped around because it's not what we're used to. We're used to brick and mortar, man, go to class. You gotta sit in there, it's all about that. You know, the reality is there's much better ways to educate the force. They are absolutely more efficient and they are absolutely more effective in attaining the end result that we're trying to get to. So we're gonna go there. You'll hear more about this as we move forward. Next slide. Developmental special duties, another process by which we're implementing a, a deliberate process by which we select people to do some very critical duty in our Air Force. You know, and at any given point, we all make this Air Force happen. There is no one airman in the United States Air Force more important than the other. But there are duties that impact every airman more than others. So when you looked at these 10 developmental special duties that we kind of pulled out out of the many special duties, we decided these are so critical to the force that we are gonna look at how we put people into these positions differently. We have largely throughout the history of, the, of this duty and the process relied on volunteers. Meaning we put ads out there, people raise their hand, they wanna do it. Some of them wanna do it for all the right reasons, some of them wanna do it because they wanna live there. There were no bad reasons, to be honest, because we had provided for a system that said, hey, if you wanna do it, do it. That, you know, we'll put you through the screening process, but if you wanna do it, there's no real need for you to justify other than you just say you wanna do it. That doesn't mean they were always the best airmen to do the job. Doesn't mean we were putting them in those duties at the best time for their development as an airman. So we've kinda, kinda looked at these at the staff, tech, and master level of how we're gonna look at these folks in the developmental phase of their careers. When is the right time to pull them out and they have the right skills. And we're gonna do it via a nominative process, which is currently in execution, the first iteration of this. And the good news here is when you go to this nominative process, so some might say, well, that's just another word for non-volunteer. Uh, so let me kind of clear up the volunteer piece. Remember all when you went to the MEP station, right? Volunteer, okay, we're done there. And every four to six years, you do the same thing again. We don't, you, you're a volunteer. If you're sitting in this room, you're a volunteer. It's all volunteer for us. I mean, you've told me you want to serve, right? You've told the United States Air Force you want to serve in the capacity that we need you to serve. If you have some type of contingency clause in there, you'd have to show that to us. And if not, you either step up to what we need you to do or you have to make another decision in life. But we need the best airmen doing this because it's gonna impact all airmen across the enterprise. But I'm telling you, kind of build to the next slide. Here's an example of why this really does work. A lot of people don't know they have potential. A lot of people don't think about them cells and the ways that we see them as an Air Force. People kind of get really good at their job, they like their job, and they're happy to do that job. And we kind of build the enlisted force that way because we're very technical. For the first 10 to 12 years, it's really technical. So you get very associated with your technical skill in our Air Force. You're proud to be an airman, but you're probably just as proud, if not sometimes more proud, to do the job you're doing. And think less about being an airman. This is about being an airman and doing what you need to do. So this is uh, Tech Sergeant Kit DeChan. You know, I, I've talked to Kit. I met him when I was over at Insulik, and uh, you know, he told me his story, and it's kind of an interesting story because he's self-professed. So I get to say this because he said it was okay. I wouldn't call him that. But he, he would describe himself prior to his transformation as a dirtbag airman, Joe Bag of Donuts, sewing his uniform up daily because he had rips in it. He'd sew it when he got home, but he didn't want to buy a new one. You know, it, it, at a given point, the uniform was in the stage, he said, where really, it was just all greasy, dirty. So, you know, it kind of looked okay then because there wasn't any clean spots. But he was just kind of going along. I mean, this is, and, and he had this attitude. He said he had this kind of chip that he couldn't really describe how it evolved over time, but it was basically, what's in it for me? You know, what are you doing for me, Air Force? What's in it for me? But he met that master sergeant there in the middle when he went to ALS. And uh, he kind of said, he sat down with him and he said, hey, what's going on here? And he had a conversation with him. He said, you're better than this. He showed him that he said, hey, you know, you could be a lot better airman than you are. 
And he talked to her and asked him about what his goals were and what does he really want out of life? What does he want out of this service? You know, what does he really want to do? So he kind of went through and this transformation started. And then they happened to join again. So that took place at Nellis. They were both at Nellis together when he met him in ALS. So the tech sergeant, now Mass Sergeant, was an ALS instructor at Nellis and uh, Tech Sergeant DeChan went there, Kit went there, and so he kind of got right. So then he ends up being stationed at Insulik, and just so happens now the Commandant is that Tech Sergeant that was his instructor. Hires him on the spot the very first time he meets him walking around a base. Now this guy's got a great story. He's a sharp airman. He's articulate. Remember that storyteller initiative that we talked about? That's this guy. This is the guy that is the impetus behind that idea. We're doing that storytellers around our Air Force right now. Aviano, Ramstein, Lodges. They, they just did one, or getting ready to do one at Peterson. I mean, they just did one at Peterson. They're getting ready to do one at, out at uh, Cannon here uh, next month. I mean, this is, a, this is a big deal. Just think about the turnaround. This guy could have been left to his own devices. This airman could have just been left to, okay, you know, end of enlistment, time to go on to something else. And all it took was an NCO sitting down and inspiring him. And look at the potential that he had. And he never knew he had it until somebody told him he had it. That's the power of our airmen. Next slide. This is what it's all about. It's about our airmen. It's about our families. This is how it gets done every single day. All about these airmen, all about the family. And that's air power. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Chief uh, warned me that he may have some time for some questions, but he's out of time. He's, uh, but those remarks, I think, were certainly fitting on uh, the 66th birthday of the United States Air Force and Chief. On behalf of our Chairman George Mulner and our President uh, Craig McKinley, first let me thank you for, uh, for your service and certainly that of Athena as well. Your Air Force Association stands ready to serve alongside with you and Athena as you go out and try to do everything you can for our airmen and their families. And we stand with you. Whatever you need, wherever you go, whatever the requirement is, your Air Force Association will be there alongside you as well. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your service. Keep serving. We need you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Chief, the rock star will be here for signing autographs and turning.